Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Corumbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, brought to you today by SaneBox. Get control of your inbox. SaneBox is your answer. Go to SaneBox.com slash martini for your no-obligation two-week trial, plus $25 in credit just for saying you got it through us. That's SaneBox.com slash martini. Jim Garrity of National Review is here. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today, starting with the good, and it's a legitimately good martini from the Republican ticket for president of the United States. So, of course, it doesn't feature Donald Trump. It features the (laughs) vice presidential nominee, Mike Pence, who got a very difficult question from a Gold Star mother who has been upset with the way Donald Trump has been responding to the Gold Star family from the Democratic National Convention. Here is part of her question, with the Trump fans increasingly upset with her, and and you'll also hear the first part of Mike Pence's response, and we'll have a couple other pieces of it a little bit later on. Here's the first part. Time and time again, Trump has disrespected our nation's armed forces and veterans, and his disrespect for Mr. Khan and his family is just an example of that. Will there ever be... When you're able to look at Trump in the eye and tell him enough is enough. You have a son in the military. It's okay. How do you tolerate his disrespect? Well, I thank you for the question. It's all right. It's all right. Folks, that's what uh, that's what freedom looks like and that's what freedom sounds like. Okay? Let me just say first I want to honor your son's service to the country and your family's service to the country. I truly do, man. And then he honored the Khan family. Let me say, I know this has been much in the news of late, in the last few days. But as I said last night, as Donald Trump said, Captain Khan is an American hero, and we honor him and honor his family. And then he talked about why he believes people concerned about this issue should still support Donald Trump. I have never been around someone more devoted to the armed forces of this country, more devoted to the families of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, and coast guard, and no one more devoted to the veterans in this country. Jim, there's at least one honorable person on a major party ticket running for president. We talked yesterday about how this was not that difficult of an issue for the Republican ticket to address. Pence showed exactly how to do it. You acknowledge and honor the service, and you talk about what you think are the strengths at the top of your ticket, which uh, some of our listeners might disagree with, but obviously Pence is going to go there. Textbook, quality, character, answer. I don't know about you, Greg. I think it says something about this this particular news uh, election cycle, but isn't it kind of nice to, you know, the president, uh, that a presidential candidate, or in this case a vice presidential candidate, gets a question that is hostile? You know, effective, some variation of how can you live with yourself? And instead of, you know, yeah, I wish I could punch you in the nose or, or hostile, <laughs> you know, you, we could say, oh, how would Hillary handle this question? But it's... it's uh, not really true because Hillary doesn't take questions anymore. <laughs> um, you could hear him kind of telling the crowd that's, no, no, it's okay. I'm a big enough human being. I'm a big enough. I can take a hostile question. As he says, this is what freedom sounds like and freedom looks like. Freedom to be an American means not every question is going to be nice to the candidate. Sometimes it's going to be <laughs> downright hostile. And that's okay. If you want to have the presidency, you should be able to handle things like that. Pence's response is just pitch perfect, exactly what you need to say. Uh, you don't do anything that comes across as hostile or, or sneering to the Khan family. Uh, you thank them, and you don't concede the point to them, but you just kind of say, oh, now we pivot to the issue of taking care of veterans, an obvious weakness of the Obama administration. I believe it was Hillary Clinton who said, well, they're not as bad as they seem, or something like that. Like, <laughs> there, there is a really easy area to target if you don't get sucked into these disputes that make Trump look like the world's biggest, meanest jerk. And Pence is just running the textbook uh, way to do it here. Hopefully uh, Trump will take lessons from it. But come on, we, we kind of know that's not going to happen. <laughs> and this is our good martini, everybody. Oh, man. If only Mike Pence was at the top of the ticket. OK, on to the uh, bad martini now. And Hillary Clinton's had a, a rough uh, week with the truth already. We talked about it yesterday with uh, her responses to Chris Wallace about the email scandal on Fox News Sunday. Just her bewildering insistence that everything she did was above board. But as you point out, she'd never do it again, even though everything she did was fine. Now we go back to another statement that Hillary Clinton made. This was at the very same hearing where she made her infamous, at this point, what difference does it make statement to Senator Ron Johnson. Also at that hearing was uh, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, who spent most of the first few minutes of his time uh, castigating Clinton for not being on the ball when it came to the security at Benghazi. But when it came time to actually ask a question, this was the exchange. 
Is the U.S. involved with any uh, procuring of weapons, transfer of weapons, buying, selling, anyhow transferring weapons to Turkey out of Libya? To Turkey? I, I, I will have to take that question for the record. I, nobody's ever raised that with me. I, it's, I been don't. A, it's been in news reports that ships have been leaving from Libya and that they may have weapons. And what I'd like to know is the annex that was close by, were they involved with procuring, buying, selling, obtaining weapons? And were any of these weapons being transferred to other countries, any countries, Turkey included? Well, Senator, you'll have to direct, direct that question to uh, the agency that uh, ran the annex. And I will, I will see what information is available. And uh, You're saying you don't know. I do not know. I don't have any information on that. Okay, and keep in mind that that is January of 2013, meaning in the very last days of Hillary Clinton's time as Secretary of State. WikiLeaks has gotten a hold of 30,000 Hillary Clinton emails, and Julian Assange going on Democracy Now!, explaining that Hillary's explanation at that hearing is completely bogus. Those uh, Hillary Clinton uh, emails, they connect together uh, with the cables that we have published of Hillary Clinton, creating a, a rich picture of how uh, Hillary Clinton uh, performs in office, but more broadly, how um, the U.S. Department of State uh, operates. Um, so, for example, uh, the disastrous, absolutely disastrous uh, intervention uh, in Libya, the destruction of the uh, Gaddafi government, uh, which uh, led to the occupation uh, of ISIS, of large segments of uh, that country, uh, weapons flows going over to, to Syria, uh, being pushed uh, by Hillary Clinton uh, into um, jihadists uh, within Syria, including ISIS. Including ISIS. Jim, you reported on this after Roger Simon over at PJ Media broke some of these allegations. Your report pointed out that some of them turned out to be true, some of them not as accurate. But in the end, Julian Assange pointing out that Hillary Clinton's own emails proved that she was lying at that hearing. Yeah. Now, this is not the Three Martini Lunch podcast endorsing Julian Assange no. as a reliable witness, no. <laughs> trustworthy figure, or good guy. But when he comes out and he says this, it's interesting because it aligns with certain facts that we do know are true. Very often this gets kind of exaggerated or put into shorthand of, oh, Hillary, Benghazi was all about Hillary running guns to the uh, Syrian rebels and, and Islamist leaders, and there's all a terrible cover-up. Well, here's the thing. Here, here's what we do know. It is verifiable. It is proven from government documents. And this is, as you point out, uh, this was known back in 2013. This, the stories and these rumors have just kind of lured around for a while. The Libyan rebel leaders, uh, back during the uprising against Gaddafi, asked Western countries to send Stinger missiles. These are sh the shoulder-mounted surface-to-air missiles that you can use to shoot down a plane. Gaddafi's intelligence services believe the rebels were getting the missiles, uh, but they believe the French were supplying them. There is no evidence that the U.S. supplied the missiles to the uh, rebels in Libya. However, we do know the Qataris were basically sending weapons across Libya's southern border. Uh, there was a United Nations arms embargo in effect, and they were breaking it, and the U.S. knew about it and basically looked the other way. Remember, like, U.N. and re restrictions and, and rules and, and U.N. declarations and how important they are, Greg? Oh, yes. Apparently they're not, <laughs> if, if, if we want to, and we think it's a really important thing. Well, we're okay with arms smuggling uh, as long as it's our guys. Um, so the, the anti qaddafi forces did get quite a few anti-aircraft missiles. Also that they had some anti-aircraft missiles and Stinger missiles uh, in the Qaddafi regime stockpiles. Civil war goes on, people break into the bunkers, and they are all over Libya. So one of the consistent rumors has been that the U.S., that the annex that, that uh, Hillary is surprisingly and suddenly evasive about, uh, that she says she knew absolutely nothing about in Benghazi, was that their job was to recover these weapons, that they were very concerned about these weapons ending up in the wrong hands. From this, there were consistent reports that these weapons were being shipped to Syrian rebels, and interesting kind of disputing accounts of whether the U.S., knew about it, whether the U.S. was turning a blind eye to it, whether the U.S. was simply uh, trying to track it, whether you could say this is kind of a giant international version of Fast and Furious. <laughs> Let's let these weapons go over this border and see where they end up. There's kind of a whole bunch of unresolved questions about all this. And despite the fact, oh, you had so many hearings and all that kind of stuff. Look, because this stuff is highly classified, we may never know about it. And I think if the U.S. is going to be sending lots of weapons to rebels in Syria— we, we've got a good reason to be a little concerned about this, to be a little wary about this. How do we know? How are we certain? Are we that these are the good guys, and we're not actually putting arms into the hands of the next ISIS? 
Well, here along comes Julian Assange <laughs> with some uh, seemingly uh, authentic documents indicating that the State Department knew exactly what was going on with this and uh, had no problem with this. We will, ha- you know, we will take closer examination. You know, God knows if we'll actually get a serious investigation of this. But, uh, you know, if you feel like this administration has had a bad habit of sending weapons to places it shouldn't, uh, <laughs> the problem may be far, far worse than we ever suspected. Uh, yeah, absolutely amazing. This is kind of like the Iran-Iraq war when Hillary Clinton and Julian Assange are feuding because, uh, well, this might be enlightening, uh, these revelations from WikiLeaks. Let's never pretend that Julian Assange is a good guy. <laughs> It was like Snowden versus the NSA. It's possible to see two bad people fighting with each other. Right? <laughs> they can be both wrong. So, uh, Yeah, that is definitely bad news. I'll tell you some good news, though, Jim. When yeah. I opened my email this morning, <laughs> four, four messages in my inbox because SaneBox had filtered out successfully uh, the ones that I didn't need right away. You made the cut, though. You're still in my inbox because it knows that I want to hear from you. Uh, but the ones that you are still interested in checking out but don't need right away, that goes into your later folder and you can go through there SaneBox is the one company that's going to help you put your inbox in order whether you've got a hundred emails or thousands and thousands it sorts through your email removes all the trivial stuff into the different folders i mentioned so only messages in your inbox are the ones you actually want to see it removes the junk we talked yesterday about the black hole I don't know how, Jim, I got on e-entertainment's mailing list, but uh, usually I just delete it and move on because I don't want to waste the time to, say, unsubscribe. Then, now that I've got SaneBox, there was one that popped up yesterday talking about Iggy Azalea clarifying her relationship with somebody I've never heard of. (laughs) Right to the black hole. I don't ever need to hear from you people again. Oh, Greg, you missed a good one on that one. (laughs) It's huge. So, because we could all use more organization and email, we've got the great deal. We mentioned it yesterday, uh, but it's SaneBox.com slash Martini. They'll throw in an extra $25 credit on top of the two-week free trial. You don't have to enter your credit card information unless you actually want to become a customer full-time. So, there's nothing to lose by doing the free trial. Check it out today. Let us know if you love all these different features we've been talking about. Again, it's SaneBox, S-A-N-E-B-O-X.com slash martini. Jim, this just gets more fun in the email inbox every day. I don't know if the good folks at SaneBox want the slogan, hey, where'd all the crap go? <laughs> um, but that kind of was my reaction this morning because I look at my email. You've got your, your starred stuff, the stuff that you have saved in my Gmail. And then it says everything else. And usually, I think I told you, it was like the mid six figures. Um, if I were <laughs> earning as much as my email, was, I'd be a very wealthy man. Um, and I'm looking at it, and it's down to 753. And usually, this is a sign either I've been terribly hacked, uh, <laughs> the boys have gotten onto my computer and just started mass deleting everything. But no, it's all in my sane archive and my sane later and my sane no replies. And so, all it, basically, the sane box is just taking all the stuff that you feel like is clogging your email and you don't want time to deal with this, you don't want to look at all this stuff. It sorts it for you. And I'm pleased as punch to have them as a, uh, as a sponsor for the podcast because I don't have to pretend that it's a good product. <laughs> It's actually working, and I'm enjoying it. So uh, that is uh, an important point to our listeners. Um, it makes things less crazy. And say, Greg, what's our crazy martini of the day? On to the crazy martini now. And, Jim, you had a story that I think was very, very important that came out yesterday because, as we described yesterday, Donald Trump's handling of the Khan family and this controversy over the past few days has been deplorable. As we explained just a few minutes ago, Mike Pence knows exactly how to handle it. But the double standard in how the media is looking at this story, as opposed to Patricia Smith, the mother of Sean Smith, who was killed at the consulate in Benghazi, they trashed her. Listen to Chris Matthews right after this speech from the Republican National Convention. I don't understand why the Republicans would choose to put this on primetime television when they have such wonderful stories of American heroism to speak to the American people. I think it was wrong. I don't care what that woman up there, the mother, has felt. Her emotions are her own. But for the country and choosing a leader, it's wrong to have someone come up there and tell a lie about Hillary Clinton. It's not true. It's logically not true. It's manifestly not true. She had anything to do in that case, even if all the arguments about what she said afterwards or Susan Rice said afterwards on Meet the Press are true. And anybody who thinks about it for a second knows it's not true. And I think it's wrong that they ruined their evening with this. And of course, Patricia Smith said that when the bodies came back to Dover, that Hillary Clinton told her that they were going to go get the guy who made the video. And here's Hillary Clinton responding to that. I don't hold any ill feeling for someone who in that moment may not fully 
recall everything that was or wasn't said. That was a little more polite than the way Donald Trump did it, uh, Jim, but he's, that she's basically saying that Patricia Smith isn't telling the truth. And Chris Matthews is appalled, appalled that there would be emotional uh, manipulation by a party at the convention when uh, Hillary Clinton's got a lot more to do with Benghazi than Donald Trump had to do with Captain Khan's death. Yeah, I, look, I mean, even if you think, OK, that's Chris Matthews and he's just a nut job. Look, there were a lot of people who said Patricia Smith's speech at the Republican convention was a cynical exploitation of grief, unabashed exploitation. Uh, Steve Schmidt on MSNBC called the weaponization of grief, uh, a spectacle so offensive. I mean, they really tore into her, uh, perhaps none worse than that writer for GQ who said he wanted to beat her to death. Here's Patricia Smith, and she's making her case that her son died in Benghazi for no good reason. You could very much argue that she would be an angry, grieving woman as is, but what happened when they brought home the coffin is what really set her off. Patricia Smith is absolutely convinced that Hillary Clinton lied to her right after her son died and told her this nonsense story that we're going to get the peep, the person who did the video. Hillary says she didn't say it. Let's point out that other uh, families of Benghazi uh, victims also say that she said similar things to it. I'm going to make – I made this point yesterday. I'll kind of, it, it seems kind of very simple, very straightforward, very Occam's razor to me. Neither you nor I have ever met Patricia Smith. Um, we don't know her. So we, we don't know whether she's generally a good person or generally a bad person. She seems like a good person. She seems like a woman who's go, gone through something that no family should ever have to go through. We don't know if she's a fundamentally honest person or a fundamentally dishonest person. We can argue what advantage she has in making up a story about what Hillary Clinton said at this event. Or, or maybe you could say, OK, maybe her memory is not 100 uh, percent clear. She misunderstood the remarks, misheard it. Fine. But Greg, you and I and just about all the American people, we know Hillary Clinton, despite the endless reintroductions and all the efforts. Oh, you don't know the real. No, no. We know her. She's been <laughs> front and center in our life since 1992. And the one thing we've learned about her and polling affirms this, we know she lies. She lies a lot. She tells big lies. She tells small lies. She tells, you know, one lie after another. And so the idea that Hillary Clinton would come out and tell a lie and say, oh, this is because of a video and we're going to get that guy. Hey, you know what? This feels pretty plausible to me. All right. The idea that Hillary would be looking for a scapegoat, the idea that Hillary would be looking for an excuse to explain why Benghazi had gone so wrong and why they seem to be completely caught off guard by a terrorist attack on September 11th. This is fitting the Occam's razor explanation that Hillary Clinton is a, is a shameless liar. And then when things go bad, she starts making excuses here. So if you want to say the cons deserve to be treated much better by Donald Trump, uh, then absolutely. I'm in total agreement of that. However, it's kind of fascinating that Patricia Smith just got airbrushed out of history and nobody really wants to talk about it. Other than to say, oh, wasn't it terrible and exploitative? A political convention is no place for a grieving parent. Right, Greg? <laughs> Apparently not. At least not in Cleveland. Only in Philadelphia. A ludicrous double standard. We can argue about how central that is, and it certainly doesn't excuse what Trump is saying. But uh, it is really insufferable to see the entire mainstream media have this giant – you can get whiplash – uh, from how quickly their perceptions change and whether it's well, what is considered acceptable discourse and what isn't. As a fun uh, radio host in D.C. likes to say, if the Democrats didn't have double standards, they'd have no standards at all. And obviously that applies to their allies in, in many cases in the mainstream media as well. Jim, on that note, uh, talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. And a reminder to all our listeners to get control of your inbox, sanebox.com slash martini for that no-obligation two-week trial, plus $25 in credit by signing up at sanebox.com slash martini. Join us again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.